Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Ruben Grima, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Ruhila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ruben Grima is a senior lecturer in the Department of Conservation and Built Heritage at the University of Malta where he lectures mainly in cultural heritage management. He read for his PhD in archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology, US, UCL. Before joining the University of Malta, he held various curatorial roles at Malta's National Museum of Archaeology. From 2003 to 2011, he served as Heritage Malta's senior curator responsible for prehistoric world heritage sites. His current research interests include cultural landscapes, the history of archaeology, and public engagement with the past. The title for today's talk is The Politics of Conservation in the British Colony. The history of conservation and management of archaeological sites and historical buildings in the 19th and early 20th centuries closely bound to the history and politics of the imperialist adventures of Western European powers. The treatment of cultural heritage in the territories under their control was shaped by these interests and struggles. This talk will focus on the specific case of Malta, a small island and crown colony under British control from 1800 to, 18, 19, to 1800 to 1964. Developments in this microcosm will be located in the wider context of development across the British imperial system and other contemporary world empires. It will be argued that developments across different parts of these imperial systems often had significant influences and repercussions on how cultural heritage was treated in other colonies and positions, sometimes even when these were on the other side of the globe. Before I request Dr. Grima, I request all of you to please mute your microphones. We will be taking the questions right at the end of the talk. So please type those in the chat box. And also type in your name, email ID, and name of the organization. Thank you, Ruben, for doing this. Over to you. Thank you, Padma, for your very kind introduction. And uh, I must say also a big thank you to the Intact Conservation Institute and to Dr. Royla for organizing this series and for your invitation to participate. When uh, I first heard about the series, the first thought I had was that it would be interesting to share a few thoughts about Malta's experience in the management of cultural heritage during the British colonial period, because that can resonate in, in, in interesting ways, even to colleagues uh, in, in India. And uh, that is what I will try to do a bit of in the next hour, because uh, it, it is um, a subject which one can continue to delve into. So I, I want to emphasize this is very much a work in progress. I uh, revisited some past work I had done uh, for, for this presentation, but even while preparing for this, I became aware of many possible new avenues to pursue. So it's been immensely uh, useful for me too. And as I say, it is very much a work in progress. And I thought, so can, can you see my my second slide now? Is that yeah. behaving? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, actually I should switch to, to the slide view again. Uh, um, well, yeah, okay. There are apologies. So, uh, to begin with, uh, in, in case some of you may be wondering where Malta is, it's the first thing to note about Malta is that it is absolutely minuscule. Uh, it has a surface area of 316 square kilometers. And I did a quick comparison uh, with the surface area of India. It is roughly one in 10,000 uh, of that. Okay, India is 10,000 times as large in surface area, just to get a sense of the difference in scale. In fact, you can't even see it on on this map. We'll need to zoom in there into the central Mediterranean. 
and you still can barely see it there. And before zooming in again, uh, one remark I want to make is that the, the reason that the uh, British Imperial authorities decide to keep Malta after the Napoleonic Wars was precisely because of their interests in India. After what uh, Napoleon attempts to do in his Egyptian adventure in 1798, they realized that they need to guard the Mediterranean corridor to India. And of course, this becomes even more important after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. But long before that, they realized that Malta is a very, very useful, very strategic staging post because of its position, which you see in this black rectangle here, this black square. And zooming in again, that's the Maltese archipelago, so about 80 kilometers south of Sicily. And it's also probably useful very quickly for those not familiar with the Maltese context to run through some of the cultural highlights of, of uh, the Maltese, of the exploitation of this island archipelago over the past 7,000 years. It probably one of the best known elements of Maltese cultural heritage is the prehistoric Neolithic culture that creates these quite magnificent and very sophisticated uh, monuments, which um, today we know of, of about 30 such sites. This is one of the larger ones at Mnaidra. And those are some interior views. You can see that they still stand to a height of uh, six, seven meters in some instances. And these have fascinated antiquarians and archeologists since at least the 17th centuries. From the same period, and the underground rock hewn site of the Hypogeum at Saflini. Some of these sites continue to be used through the Bronze Age and into the Phoenician period. This is the example of the Silch. And uh, inevitably, Malta is, uh, becomes part of uh, a succession of spheres of influence, of civilizations, which control much of the Mediterranean. So we have the Phoenicians, the Romans, as we see in this house in Rabat. Uh, after the Byzantine period, for about 200 years, Malta is part of the Arab world. And uh, it's retaken by the Normans in 1090. And then it goes through a succession of different kingdoms until it ends up as part of the Aragonese crown and then it's given to the Knights of St. John. And this again is one of the best known moments in the past of the Maltese archipelago. And you see here a 16th century representation of the city of Valletta, which is still the capital of um, Malta today. And this was a city created, a Renaissance city created by the Knights of St. John. I'm speaking to you from about over here at the moment, if you can see my cursor. And of course, they invest hugely in the Baroque rebuilding of the city, which uh, is one of the reasons that it is a World Heritage Site nowadays. And then after a short interlude, when uh, the French Napoleonic forces take Malta, the Maltese rise up against them, ask for the help of the British, and uh, that is how we become a part of the British Empire effectively in 1800. So you can see that in spite of its tiny size, there's a immense density of human activity accumulating over 7,000 years. So there's a very high density of cultural heritage, especially archeological and built heritage on the islands. So, um, the questions I uh, want to look at, I think it's useful, first of all, to ask the question of why is it even interesting? Why should we bother to ask about the political context of past heritage management and conservation? It's, it, archaeologists and conservators may be tempted to say, I do not 
do politics and I'm not interested in politics. I just do archaeology or I, I just do conservation. But there has been a paradigm shift in the last 20 years or so through much of the debates happening in public archaeology, for instance, and likewise even in, in cultural heritage management more, more widely, that we need to be aware of the social, historic, political contexts in which we operate. And we need to be aware of the possible deployment and use of our professional efforts and even of the possible consequences that they can have if abused. And another reason why it's interesting to look at the what's happening in, in the late 19th and early 20th century, which is what I will focus on, is that this, this is an extremely formative period in the field of cultural heritage management. And uh, it is still an influence in our thought processes, in our mindsets today. And it's useful to, to be aware of, of this legacy and when we need to distance ourselves from it perhaps, and when we need to build on it as a strength. And of course, in, in the period we're looking at, nationalism and colonialism are dominant forces around the globe. And they are also shaping our fields. And one very, very important paradigm shifting study, which uh, has influenced the debate and certainly influenced my thinking immensely, uh, is a book which was first published in 1983 by uh, Benedict Anderson. And it's called Imagined Communities. And the imagined communities that he speaks about are how in colonial contexts, and Anderson primarily studies uh, French colonies in Southeast Asia, but his argument is valid for 19th century colonialism generally. He looks at how identities were being constructed to help legitimize the imperial constructs and the systems of exploitation that were being created to make them normal and make them seem as if they are the best possible way for the world to be ordered and arguably for those systems to remain and be perpetuated. So, uh, and yes, and part of his argument is how identities also make use of the past in this exercise of construction of identities to legitimize the imperial project. And one, I'll, I'll just give one, one of the best quoted, one of the, the, the most quoted and best known examples is that of the ruins of Great Zimbabwe in uh, what is today Zimbabwe, named after this archaeological site, in fact, but which for a long time in the colonial period was known as Rhodesia, named after Cecil Rhodes in a great act of colonial imperialistic hubris. And for a long time, and this even persists into the 1960s, uh, believe it or not. For a long time, the narrative promoted by the colonial authorities and even by many archeologists in the 19th century was that the ruins of Great Zimbabwe are such an amazing monument. They're so ex such an extraordinary achievement that they could not have been achieved by the Sub-Saharan natives of what was then Rhodesia. So the cultural heritage of these people, which could have become an empowering discourse, which would have led them to question imperial authority by referring to the achievements of previous inhabitants of, 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 of their country, was being denied them by a narrative which was incorrect, which was a a, an illusion, a deception ultimately, that these could only have been built by people coming from elsewhere, either the Phoenicians or, or something even more exotic. So you see how deployment and manipulation of the past can have very, very acute, serious political consequences and can be distorted 
by political consequences. And this persisted even into the way the site was managed, even as late as the 1960s. And it's a very well-known case about which there, there's considerable literature. Now, in Malta, these phenomena are much more subtle. They need to be teased out. But it does not mean that they're not present. And that is what I will be trying to tease out today. So uh, the questions I'm asking are, did the political context in the British colonial period influence approaches to conservation of cultural heritage in Malta? And how does this relate to developments in other countries also controlled by Britain? And I'm going to focus mainly on the period from the 1870s to the 1930s, uh, which is uh, immensely formative. I should also make it clear, I think it's already obvious by now, that I'm using conservation in the widest possible sense, yeah, in the most inclusive sense, as defined in the Barra Charter, as all the processes that look after a place so as to retain its cultural significance. Okay, so, so we're thinking in terms of preservation and management in a, in a broad, inclusive sense here. Now, the, the way I will approach this is by looking at these four different strands and the interaction between them. So not just looking at cultural heritage management and conservation practices and the legal frameworks, which are developed to, to, to safeguard cultural heritage, but even it's, it's also useful to look at the individuals, the protagonists and the relationships between them, which can ultimately influence the way history unfolds. And even equally importantly, the way that the past was being understood and narrated and what its significance was, because that obviously shapes the way it is curated, the way it is conserved, and the way it is presented. Now, one way to think about it, and this is quite arbitrary, is that there are, if, if we're looking at the period between 1800 and the 1930s, we can identify three broad stages. Yeah? The first moment is, is less affair, that is, before the period we are concerned with, I will look at that briefly, to set the stage for the following periods. Between the 1880s and 1914, there is a transformation across the globe, really. It starts in the 1870s. Is, it, is, uh, is the presentation still visible? Can you still hear me? Yes, Ruben, please. Yes, it's okay. Yes. So uh, the, uh, the, the most important transformation that we will look at today is happening, is beginning in some parts of the globe in the 1870s and really spreading uh, in the 1880s. And certainly in Malta, there's a transformation happening there. And it continues to unfold right up to the First World War. And then in the period between the wars, there is a consolidation of this new way of thinking about the past. And that's the third stage I'll look at. So pressing on, uh, the first moment in, 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 in the first part of the 19th century, there's very little regulation of cultural heritage in, in the Maltese islands, certainly. And archaeological excavation is considered a sport, a hobby, which anyone who affords to can engage it on, on a Sunday afternoon just for their amusement. So there's a lot of unregulated plundering and destruction as a result. And government feels very little accountability, very little responsibility for all this. The, the colonial government in Malta does not see it as its problem. So there are practically no measures to control this. And we have many examples. This is one excavation happening in the 1820s. And you see the Duke of Buckingham and Shandos there who turns up on the site and they excavate part of the site for him to make a discovery, which was 
probably planted there in advance. This used to happen in Pompeii too in the 18th and 19th century. It was a common practice. And uh, you can see, you know, well-dressed gentlemen in white trousers uh, who are clearly wealthy visiting archaeological sites as quite an exclusive pastime while uh, there's an excavation happening in the background there which more recently has been re-excavated and you can see that the, the local population is not being represented as engaged in this process from the 1860s we have the formation of an archaeological society and a growing awareness that this immense resource needs to be better taken care of. In this case, we're seeing a photograph of a visit by the Archaeological Society to one of these megalithic sites, the temples of Hajar Im. And yes, they are behaving in a way which we would not consider acceptable today, but we stand on their shoulders. These were the people beginning to create awareness of the need for better protection and legislation and to apply pressure for this. And they're even drawing attention to how some megalithic remains, as we see here, with these, you see these prehistoric blocks are part of a megalithic temple structure and it's been incorporated into a modern farmer's hut. And this is something they are deploring and hoping will be corrected. And this brings us to the second stage, when the big transformation happens. And in Malta, this begins at the start of the 1880s. And this is when the state takes on active responsibility for the care of uh, cultural heritage resources and begins to expropriate sites and develop conservation practices and even set up legal frameworks. And similar transformations are being reflected in some cases slightly earlier across most of the globe, not only within the British Empire, but even within, within other imperial systems of the time. And this is a, a very selective sample of some of the things going on. So on the left here, we have a few of the turning points, the key events in Malta at this time. And on the right, there are just a few, this is just a small selection of some key developments happening in other parts of the empire, particularly in India, such as the, the setting up of the archaeological survey as a distinct government department. It has earlier origins, but in 1871, it becomes a formal um, government department in the public service in India. And uh, uh, meanwhile, in Britain, in 1873, we have the first attempt with a private member's bill to create legislation on the preservation of monuments in the United Kingdom, what was then the United King Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And uh, this law eventually is enacted in 1882. And it is within the context of the British Empire, the first comprehensive piece of legislation to protect cultural heritage uh, being expressly written by the British imperial system. At the same time that uh, that is reaching a conclusion, so the year before, in 1881, there are quite a number of developments in Malta, including the request for a report on the antiquities of Malta. And this is also happening in India at the same time, incidentally. Several reports are being compiled in the same year as in the early 1880s. And I will zoom in on this in a moment, and, and this is a, an, an important part of our story today. Meanwhile, in, uh, in India, another very important piece of legislation is enacted in 1904 with the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act. Uh, a year later, we have legislation in Cyprus. In Malta, we get our first legislation in 1910. Meanwhile, of course, there's a lot more happening. In 1903, practically within months of the museum's department being created in Malta, you have the position of director of antiquities being set up in Cyprus as well. And uh, in the following years, 
uh, this process intensifies across many of the other territories and countries controlled by the British Empire. Now, zooming in on what's happening in Malta in 1881, an important moment is when, because of all the concern that was being raised, even in the British Parliament, about the state and the neglect of monuments in Malta, Lord Kimberley, who is then Secretary of State for the Colonies, so effectively the minister responsible for the administration of British colonies, asks the governor of Malta, Borton, Sir Arthur Borton, to produce a report on the conservation and management, on the preservation and the condition of these monuments. Now, within a year, this beautiful book is published by the then, it's written by the then librarian who was also responsible for antiquities, Annetto Antonio Caruana. And this is a very erudite study of the different archaeological sites which had been discovered till then. But it says nothing about their condition, nothing about their management, nothing about their conservation. And it's dispatched from Malta on the 10th of April, naturally goes there by sea, which takes nearly two weeks. So clearly we have the reply from the Secretary of State dated 25th April. Clearly the moment this document lands on his desk, the Secretary of State or, or someone in his office studies it immediately and sees that it is not what they ask for. And they write back and say, we want concrete suggestions for the preservation of archaeological monuments. Thank you for this wonderful study, but it's not what we asked for. So, and this is critical. And then the governor scrambles and calls up the librarian again, Annette Antonio Caruana, and tells him we need a different report and we need it quickly. So he writes 600 words. This is actually the, the copy by a clerk of uh, his report, which is kept in Malta. The original is at Q and it's written in even less tidy handwriting, actually. So it's clearly produced in a hurry. But in 600 words, Caruana manages to achieve all you see in this list. So he sets up an agenda with priorities for cultural heritage, a setup for formal management, legislation, a research agenda. He even describes some conservation procedures which I will look at conservation in the sense of material conservation now in uh, the uh, stricter, narrower sense. And he asks for a budget and even proposes a national museum, all in 600 words. And that lays the foundation for cultural heritage management in Malta, arguably right up until today. And this is a quote from that report where he's looking at the physical preservation of these monuments. And he says, this may be secured by rebonding their exterior walls with smaller stones fallen from within them uh, to help consolidate and, and the entire structure. Because many of these megalithic structures are made of double walls with megalithic external walls, but then a soil and rubble fill. So once that begins to wash out, the there is more risk. The entire structure becomes more vulnerable. And here he's saying that uh, he's describing a procedure to put these together again. And we need to understand that there was very little literature to consult in terms of guidelines and, and uh, agreed principles and conventions at the stage. And they had very little time to think about it. Uh, they really had to think on their feet and come up with practical solutions. And we have evidence matching up that document with some monuments such as this Bronze Age defensive wall, which is at Borchen Nadur in the south of Malta. We can actually see the result of one of these interventions. You can see all these smaller stones between the gaps were inserted at this period. And we know this from the documentation. We have plans, this is the same wall, and we know that it was being excavated in 1881. So 
practically at the same time. And we even have early photographs. One in 1901 is showing that intervention already complete, very much as we see it today. And we have, luckily, as part of the same album created by that archaeological society, which I showed you some images from earlier, we have an image of the same wall before this intervention, when none of those smaller wedges have been inserted. Yeah? So it's with, with this combination of evidence, it's very clear that this intervention is taking place at the time that Caruana is writing that report or soon after. This is another shot from the same angle uh, after that consolidation. Another process which begins at exactly the same time, and we see it on a nearby site, is the appropriation or expropriation of archaeological sites for their preservation. In this case, we're looking at a um, Roman farmstead uh, for olive pressing. And uh, th this entire area was acquired by government. And even here, you can see this boundary wall which surrounds a beautiful cistern, which uh, forms part of the same site, because that wall is the limit of expropriation. And also shortly after, on another site, which is being excavated at the same time, in this case, a Roman urban house, we have the creation of a, an on-site museum, which is the first purpose-built on-site archeological museum in Malta again with very novel solutions, the way they're creating this reconstruction of the peristyle around this um, uh, beautiful mosaic in the central courtyard. Uh, also uh, achieving a useful balance between economy and by, by having simpler columns for replacing most of the peristyle columns and legibility and of course this also helps the legibility of the site because it makes it clear that this is a modern intervention which cannot be mistaken with the original and also integrating some of the original elements there and i'm sure this will be a quote uh, familiar to many of you and, and the personality familiar if not <laughs> very popular uh, to many of you. Uh, what we've seen, this transformation we're seeing in Malta is another expression of a spirit which is spreading across the entire imperial administrative system at this time. And here we are having it from the mouth of the then Viceroy of India, where he's officially recognizing that this is a responsibility of the state when he says, it is our duty to dig and discover, to classify, reproduce, describe, copy, decipher, cherish and conserve. Yeah? He's now making it very clear that this has become, by the 1890s, an unquestionable responsibility of governments everywhere. And by implication, even colonial governments uh, shared in that responsibility. Now, of course, that might sound like simple and tidy, but there's a lot more going on in terms of contestation and different ways of looking at this. And one idea which is uh, recurrent across many of these imperial systems is the idea of the great monument. This is the same Roman cistern I referred to earlier. And even the way the camera is positioned and the way Themistocles Amit, the, the director of museums, is posing there, is accelerating, is accentuating the, the uh, monumentality and the sheer scale of the sister. And what is also happening at this moment, and here we can recall the story we, we started with about Great Zimbabwe, in the Maltese context, the discovery of these monuments is quickly deployed by those individuals who are resisting British colonial authority and saying that the Maltese should have more autonomy and more rights to self-determination. And again, this is 
a quote which really sums up the spirit of these people at the time when they say, we have been a civilized people since very ancient times. We were already civilized when another people, and this is clearly a, a reference to Britain, rather pointed, who now pretend to have mastered civilization were in savagery. So quite, quite uh, heavy use of language here. We have a civilization of which any people may be jealous. Behold our historic temples. When, when this man is saying this, people still believe that these were Phoenician sites. They hadn't yet understood and embraced the fact that these were prehistoric sites. That was to come around 1900. Not to be found anywhere else in Europe. So already the presence of archaeology is being deployed politically and contested. And uh, the colonial authorities are quick to realize that they have to tread carefully here, that if uh, they cannot afford to neglect and allow money to be directed to the conservation of these sites. And at the same time, this can be used as a stick to beat them with. And, and again here, we see how this is one of the most iconic facades of a megalithic temple. And again, it's back to this idea of wanting your monuments to be as monumental and as grand as possible, because that facade we see today is in fact largely the result of anastylosis. And uh, many of those megaliths uh, were found on the ground in, in the 19th century and were only uh, put in the place you see them today, and this is taken from the work of a colleague, Katia Stroud, uh, where you see that a large part of that is assembled in the 20th century to make the monument even more monumental. Another development is the first legislation we have in Malta in 1910, and you can see uh, in this quick list that it, it also had a number of gaps which are addressed later. So archaeological excavation is not being regulated at this stage. You, you just had the obligation to inform the governor rather than to acquire a permit at this stage. That comes later. And even so, in spite of all these early efforts, many archaeological sites, such as these Bronze Age silo pits, are still destroyed. This happens in 1920, for example, for uh, uh, the creation of a road for military purposes. So there's still a lot of concern about this. And this brings us to the third stage, which is the consolidation of this new way of regulating heritage, which we see emerge in the second stage. So we have more comprehensive legislation being enacted in 1925 and the expropriation and enclosure of more sites. And also this growing awareness of the political implications of the narratives about the past, which was being revealed by this archeology. span So this is typical, this is something you see throughout the world and, and from the 1880s onwards, modeled on, on the British model largely. The idea of the site is uh, expropriated, becomes government property to be preserved, put in cotton wool, and usually have a wall built around it or a fence yeah, to, to protect it. So they were being excised and divorced from the landscape. Here you see another protagonist in, in this period, he, he spans Sir Temistocles Amit, is director of museums for the first decades of the 20th century. And in one of the prehistoric sites that he excavates, uh, Tarshin, he, what you, you see here, made with smaller masonry to consolidate the prehistoric megaliths, which had been chopped away because there was a field over the site. Uh, he does this both to consolidate them structurally, as described by Caruana in that 1880s report, but also to give a sense of the volume of, uh, of this monument. And it's a very successful intervention in many ways. It's using local materials, which are very cheap, local labor, which is, and skills, which were easily available. It uh, is easily reversible. 
And um, it is also very legible once you know that the smaller blocks are modern reconstruction and, and the uh, larger blocks are the original prehistoric structure. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, they try to improve on this and the megaliths get encased in uh, using the Portland cement, uh, unfortunately. And uh, for all the reasons that this was a success, that intervention is, is very much a uh, much less uh, happy one. The number of sites known shoots up during this period, mostly excavations by Themistocles and Meat. And in the broader historical picture, it's useful to recall that uh, in 1919, after the First World War, there's uh, a lot of public unrest. This is a period when there is direct rule. So we do not have self-government. And there are riots in Valletta because of mass unemployment. And there's an incident when soldiers are called out to suppress the riots and uh, a number of people are shot and four people are killed. And this happens in June uh, 1919. And many of you will be thinking uh, that th this is uh, very close in date. Uh, less than two months before is when the Amritsar massacre happens. And it is, of course, there are many differences in detail and differences in scale, but ultimately it is the same imperial system which is making these incidents possible. And as a reaction to that, and because of the outrage that follows, in 1921, Malta is again granted a self-government constitution with a Senate and Legislative Assembly. And it is this under this constitution that Malta gets its second antiquities legislation. And part of the problem is that it is quite a complex system. And because of all the movements to resist colonial authority, you have a lot of prolonged debates. It's not a very efficient parliament. It's not a very efficient uh, legislative assembly because even the to, to enact this legislation takes two years of discussion. The beauty of it is that we can see when people are discussing each detail, we have a record of how the legislation, the, for the first drafts are being tweaked and adapted to the local context. And uh, a commission is sent in 1931, which is going to be part of our story. And then in 1933, uh, because of all this, uh, the, all the disputes about the use of language and a story there's no time to go into today, the constitution is suspended um, and then definitively in, in 1933. Meanwhile, people's understanding of what the prehistoric megalithic monuments that we have looked at represent and what and who build them were going through important changes. So until the 18th century, most people believed that they had been built by a race of giants. In the late 18th century, there's the realization that these were probably built, or, or the, the new interpretation, that they were built by the Phoenicians because that was the best fit they could find. Okay, they said, these are not like Greek temples. There are these strange exotic people who are the Phoenicians, we don't know much about, therefore these monuments must be built by then. And this lasts until 1900. And um, only at the turn of the 20th century is there the realization that this is a much older prehistoric culture, thousands of years old. And in this shot, on an excavation of another of these sites, you can see three protagonists forming the interpretation of what these monuments mean and in the uh, context of 1920s Malta. And they're all collaborators of Themistocles Zamit, who we've already met. And their captain, Albert Laferla, who have eventually becomes the director of education. So very influential in terms of forming young minds in the educational system. Uh, architect Carmelo Rizzo, who is uh, the, the director of uh, waterworks and a friend and collaborator of Zamit, and uh, architect 
Robert Gallia, later Professor Robert Gallia, who becomes rector of the university after Themistocles Zammit passes away in 1935. And thanks to the 1931 Royal Commission, we see the members of that commission here going on a day trip to the second island of the archipelago, to Gozo, accompanied by Professor Themistocles Zammit, yeah, it's where he is explaining his understanding and his narrative of the Maltese past and, that, and including its prehistory. And you see the various members of that commission, which is investigating constitutional matters. They're boarding the boat there. And I'll just remind you of what Ron Kalli was saying some decades earlier, two generations earlier, about how these extraordinary megalithic monuments were being used as part of the credentials, the political credentials of the Maltese nation as a uh, distinct nation which deserved more autonomy, more rights, more self-government. And um, this is still a very strong sentiment at the time of the 1931 Royal Commission. And you can see that for people like Themistocles Zammit, it is inseparable, their, their, their understanding of what these monuments were is inseparable from the way they thought about themselves and their identity. And look at what he's saying here. Although we cannot prove it, everything tends to show that when the Maltese prehistoric monuments were built, those people spoke a Semitic language, which is what the Maltese language, which is essentially fundamentally Arabic, even today, uh, was being described at in that period. And this is part of his evidence to the Royal Commission. Robert Gallia, his colleague and successor, is even more blunt about this. He says, some say that the modern Maltese language is Phoenician, others say that it is Arabic. And then he says, for myself, I am convinced that whichever people that language has belonged to, it must have been the language of the pioneers of civilization at the time that Malta was first inhabited when the megalithic monuments, which today we call temples, are being built. And this is an extraordinary statement, completely unfounded, you know, to assert that thousands of years ago, people were speaking the same language that the Maltese inhabitants were speaking today is extraordinary. And the only way to explain it is that it's being shaped by this desire to create more legitimacy, you know, to create a, a genesis for the Maltese as a distinct uh, nation. And then this idea, and we see this even in Zamit's writings, there is the idea that all the different cultures and, and, and powers which controlled Malta at different stages were foreigners, just visiting, not interbreeding with the local population. And that there's this primordial native Maltese population, which remains unchanged genetically uh, by all this. It's like a, this idea of a pure Maltese race, okay? Which this is. And even, even more recently, uh, this is a traditional type of uh, shelter, which we find in the Maltese countryside, very common in the early modern period and right, right up till today. Many of these date from the 19th century, but probably most of the ones we know are built in the last few hundred years. But look what's happened here. This was the school book I had when I was at secondary school. Jrayit Malta, it was, it was called then. Okay, so it's uh, created in the 1970s and 1980s. And look at the structure here. They've inserted this early modern type of dwelling into the prehistoric landscape. Yeah, this is meant to be a representation of the prehistoric inhabitants with their uh, prehistoric temple on the hilltop there. And their dwellings are being shown as these quite modern uh, core built structures. Uh, 
And we knew at the stage before these books were published, we knew that from archaeological evidence from David Trump's excavation at Scorba, mainly, that prehistoric huts did not look like these at all. So you see how this idea that the temples are built by a primordial Maltese race, which is connected to the present population, is a very persistent one. Yeah. While in fact, of course, a much more realistic model is one where you have much more hybridity and interaction. And what is Maltese today is a result of an eclectic mix of all these. I, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, so I'm, I need to speed up a bit. I had to mention in in passing that some very important work is happening at the moment in this long-term research project uh, by two colleagues, professors Andrea Pessina and Nicholas Vella, on uh, an Italian archaeologist active in Malta. And there's a whole political dimension to that in terms of how the fascist government in Italy is trying to use a charm offensive and to use archaeology to promote its interests in promoting Italian influence beyond Maltese shores. And the publications in, which have been issued so far by Pessina and Vella and are forthcoming in the coming months uh, treat that exhaustively. But I'm, I'm going to look at a different angle of what's happening at the same time in the 1930s. So we have the suspension of self-government at this moment. So it is politically a delicate moment. And this gentleman, Sir Harry Luke, is sent as uh, Lieutenant Governor of Malta between 1930 and 1938. And as you can see here, his career, as with many of the uh, colonial officials of the time, involved tours of duty in different colonies. So these people and their networks are also spreading ideas and ways of thinking about how to manage cultural heritage across different colonies. And uh, you see him here in Palestine, next to Storrs, who was also, Ronald Storrs well, was the governor in um, uh, of Jerusalem and, and Judea, while Harry Luke was his uh, assistant. And they go on, uh, in Palestine, of course, they're very influential in the shaping of the uh, antiquities law and the creation of a department of antiquities. Stores goes on to Cyprus in 1926 and 1932, where he continues to draw on his contacts in Palestine and Cyprus, uh, studied by Emmerich in particular, uh, and uses that to reform the same sector in the context of Cyprus. Meanwhile, Luke is in Malta, and in 1933, he finds the situation of self-government uh, of sorry, being uh, suspended, and therefore there is direct rule by the imperial government authorities, basically himself. And as lieutenant governor, even because the governor at the time is uh, sick, uh, for prolonged periods, he's practically in charge of the island. And as he says in his memoirs, uh, and, and, and the book he writes about Malta uh, in the post-war period, he says that he had long cherished the wish to see Malta's and Gozo's medieval remains preserved from further decay, and also some examples of buildings from the time of the Order of St. John. And uh, Another thing he says is that he has the support of the Secretary of State, the person who is the minister of, uh, in London, responsible for all the imperial uh, colonies, uh, Ormsby Gore. And that acquires more significance when in his memoirs we see in this picture that at university he was a, a very close acquaintance of Ormsby Gore. So again, you see how these networks formed in the student days of these individuals who were immensely privileged, very well educated, very erudite, and also having a lot of romantic notions and illusions about the role of empire in, in, in the world, which they all greatly believed in. And he's, he's very, you can see he's 
very attached to, to these interventions which he conducts in the spirit when he's con in control and uh, he includes them in uh, this publication that he writes with his memoirs of the time in Malta. Uh, these are two examples in Birgo and Imdina and note he's using the term Siculo Norman he believed at the time, this was what most people believed at the time, that these were from the Norman period. In fact, we know now that they're rather later. Yeah, for their, what is now called the Caramonte style. So, um, from the 15th or at the earliest uh, 14th century, much later than the Norman period. He's restoring buildings uh, from the Knights period, such as the hospital ward where he removes the great infirmary of the Knights of St. John, where he removes a partition wall. And he's also installing these inscriptions on uh, several historic buildings, only written in English. Uh, there's quite a few of them in Birgu. Uh, this is one inscription in Gozo, where they, they follow a program. In this case, it's in Latin, but including his family coat of arms and the coat of arms of Gozo. And very probably these are also created by him because this is in, an example in Valletta which commemorates the site of a house of an English knight, even though by the time of the building of Valletta, the English order had been suppressed by Henry VIII. Uh, this example here on the right is on, on a commemorating a building where a leader of the Maltese insurgents against the French, who then invites the Royal Navy to support them rise up against the French. Yeah? And, and this is one of the sites they use to bombard uh, French positions. So you see the choice of sites which he is monumentalizing isn't entirely innocent. It's a great thing and we're grateful that those interventions were conducted and they helped preserve these buildings. But you can see in the selection that there is this thread of celebrating and commemorating, you know, starting from the, what he thought was the Norman presence to emphasizing the presence of the English Lang and then the uprising uh, against the French and the collaboration between the Maltese and the English between 1798 and 1800 are all part of the narrative which is helping legitimize and uh, normalize British control of the island. I think it's fair to say that. So uh, I'm, I'm seeing my time is running out. Uh, some of the threads which emerge from all this is that clearly the political context is deeply influencing firstly uh, the way that the past is being understood, the way it is being presented, and inevitably, even certain conservation priorities and decisions in the way that uh, this culture, cultural heritage, is being managed and, and, and taken care of. And some of these currents persist as an influence. So some, some of the narratives, for example, the idea of the Maltese being here since prehistory and um, that uh, we had a succession of foreign rulers who came and left, but left us essentially the same people, uh, is still a very common one if you listen to tourist guides and politicians nowadays. Now, some future directions for research. One big realization for me is that even when comparing the legislation in all these different uh, territories and, and countries controlled by the British Empire. I mean, it, we, it's well known, of course, that you have many sentences which are practically identical when you compare these. But it's interesting to see how the differences came about. And what we need to do, and this is the next step, uh, is to look at the evolution of the drafting stage of those documents. Okay. I mean, it's 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 the obvious thing to do once once you you realize it but uh, it was only while preparing for for today that and going through the debates i was surprised by how lengthy how every single article in the 1925 legislation 
is discussed at great length. So, uh, for example, in the definition of cultural heritage, the term, there's a debate on whether to int introduce the term paleontology as one of the classes of cultural heritage material, which is not present in many of the other earlier examples of uh, cultural heritage legislation in the empire. And a person suggests it because of his paleontological interest. And then there's a big debate whether it's better to include more such classes or whether that means you're excluding the ones you don't mention. But you can actually see them thinking and seeing how the legal instrument is created. And some of that wording is still in our legislation today, you know, even in uh, the legislation which was enacted in 2002. The, the, the present Cultural Heritage Act in Malta, much of which uh, still reflects the 1925 legislation. And the, the truth is, we probably have a less detailed record of the thinking process in 1925, uh, sorry, in, in, in 2002, than we do for 1925. And it would be fascinating to look at this process across different cases, across the British Empire, and uh, to see how these legal instruments are being adapted to the specific needs of, of and, and specific context. So thank you very much uh, for listening. I hope you have found that thought-provoking and interesting, and, and, and really love to hear any questions and comments you may have. Even after today, if, if uh, even for those who might watch the video later and who aren't with us today, uh, there's my email address and I'd be delighted to correspond if, if, if you want to pursue this further. In, uh, I understand from Dr. Royla that she'll be collecting a, a written version of, of some of these presentations and there will be a fuller account there with, with, with all the references as well. So. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruben, for a lovely presentation. I think a lot of parallel, parallels could be drawn. Um, if, with your permission, I'll take the questions up. We do have one question, very interesting question. From uh, She's saying, um, dear Ruben, thank you for this presentation, uh, for such an interesting talk and important study. Her question is, is this kind of topic and research part of the study program? The second question is, is there a network of researchers who investigate this topic in various countries that have been under British rule at the same time? Could you please recommend some publications about this topic? Yes, yes. So about the first question, uh, in, uh, for example, in the cultural heritage management program that I coordinate, and even in the, um, our colleagues in uh, uh, the classics and archaeology department have a master's degree in archaeological practice. In uh, both those master's courses, we do make sure to give some exposure to our students uh, of these issues. And uh, we're inspired here by the debate which has happened in the past 30 years or so in the field of public archaeology where we have come to recognize, and I think now this is entering the mainstream, that um, understanding the social and political context of archaeology and how people are interacting with archaeology and the consequences of the way professionals conduct archaeology for their wider society are something that we are all concerned with. It's not something we just a specialist in public archaeology should be concerned with, but it's something which anyone who has the privilege of being a, a, an archaeologist or even a conservator or a curator, ultimately we do that on behalf of the community. There are communities that we serve. Most of us are ultimately paid out of taxpayers' money. And we have a responsibility to put first and foremost that public interest. And that includes 
the sharing of our understanding and even the listening to communities in defining our agendas. So that is the first part of, of, of your question. Um, a, uh, regarding the second question about a, uh, a network, there are uh, several networks, formal and informal. For example, at, uh, one network at UCL uh, studies the history of the discipline, um, which um, is, uh, th their focus isn't specifically at, at the British colonial context. Uh, so I'm not aware of such a network, but uh, it certainly uh, should be an important focus and uh, it, it would be a great idea to, to network more, certainly. And in terms of um, publications, there's several studies of um, uh, very often focusing uh, on a, a, a um, specific um, country. Um, th there are, and, and I, I should send you a, a fuller list, but some of the ones um, mentioned here, for example, uh, one important work on Cyprus, which was initially a uh, uh, a PhD, but is now published as a book, is by Keith Emmerich. So the, the PhD was back in 2002. Um, and uh, the, the, the published book forms from 2014. And he compares the, um, um, what's happening in Britain with Cyprus as a case study of how this is being reflected in colonial contexts. So extending that, you know, broadening that uh, would be uh, immensely interesting. And of course, uh, there are many contributions about the history of how this is emerging in the context of India, of course, which is one of the mothers of, of, of the uh, legal and administrative forms which are being created and copied and reflected across much of the empire. It's one of the early examples. Uh, another very influential book for me, which looks at archeology span in uh, the 19th century and looking at how nationalism and colonialism influences this is uh, by Margarita Diaz Andreu, uh, a colleague from Spain, uh, which is precisely a study of 19th century archaeology in the context of the historic political paradigms of the time. And of course, Benedict Anderson, we, we've mentioned, but there is a growing body of literature uh, on the subject, which is encouraging, but we need to network more to, uh, to um, look at some of the finer print of all this. Yes, have I answered your question? Barbara, is it yeah, that no, Really, really interesting, and thank you. No, and you answered perfectly, and thank in your presentation, there will be more literature. Anyway, thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely, really nice. I know. I think tracing the history, it's very well presented and very nicely done. I have a question. Uh, Ruben, can you please tell me, you said the act was... Uh, Again, you revised the act, the Monuments Act in 2002, I, I believe, in Monuments. Yes, yes. What were the primary changes? Like, what were the most important features that revised yes. the Ancient Monument Act? I yes. You could just clarify. Um, some of it was uh, clarification of uh, detail. There was also the need to... Uh, remove certain ambiguities and to spell out and update the powers of the state, for example. So uh, in cases where a, um, a property of uh, historic or archeological value was not being sufficiently taken care of, of the, by the owner, there was now the power 
to uh, enter that site and even to uh, conserve it at the expense of the owner. And of course, there is still the possibility of expropriation, which already existed. Another, perhaps even more important innovation introduced in um, the idea in, in, in the 2002 legislation was the idea of guardianship. And this is a way of engaging NGOs and members of the community more actively, rather than a top-down model where it is just the government which is responsible for all this with the concept of guardianship, an NGO can be allowed to become the guardian with the appropriate guidelines and management plan, who will then take care of the site in the public interest. And there's also the concept of entrustment, which also allows delegation of responsibilities from the state uh, to uh, other entities whether they're the national agency for the management of sites, uh, Heritage Malta, or even uh, other bodies. So it is trying to create more uh, polyphony, more diversity, rather than a uh, colonial style top-down model, which is what we inherited in the form of the 1925 Act. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see many questions, I think. But the talk was very concise and very nicely documented and uh, put in forth. I think we need to really relook, as you rightly said, in the documentation of what was the arguments, the various things that were taken right in the beginning, as you rightly said, and the things took place when the listing was done. So thank you, Rubin. Thank you very much for a very exciting talk. Um, I don't see any questions. Yes, thank yous and uh, thing, but no questions. As I said, uh, if anyone watches this video later yeah. uh, or even wishes to continue the conversation, I'd, I'd be delighted to just send an email to the address you see yeah. uh, over there. Yes. But thank you. Definitely there for everyone. I'm sure people will get back to you once we ponder upon everything and maybe give it a thought. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. And, and I want to say, yeah, we will be looking out for the publication as well as you promised. So probably that will also add to the whole research thing. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ruben. Thank, thank you, so you. Thank you so much Bye. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Bye.